The 49ers roster is loaded with top-end talent, but is there enough balance and depth to it? It's 49ers Day, and we're breaking them down from every angle today on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. You are Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes, your daily podcast for NFL and college football scouting. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's better than this? It's guys being dudes here on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. We're the Draft Dudes. I'm Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins. And we are your NFL experts here with you daily to talk team building across the league on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast with the Draft Dudes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We'd like to thank you for making Locked On NFL Scouting your first listen every day. And of course, a big welcome to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those who, no matter if we're talking about the 49ers or Olu Fushano, come back every single day and don't miss a single episode. We appreciate y'all being here very, very much. Joe, happy 49ers uh, evaluating a definitively good roster, legitimate Super Bowl contender day to you on Locked On NFL Scouting. And that's not to say that, that we haven't done some good rosters, but... Like San Francisco, it just hits a little different when you're doing a team that played in three of the last four conference championship games. Not to put you like in a like producer mode, but I wonder if there are the same number of franchise cornerstones on the 49ers for all the teams that we've done combined to this point. It might be the case. Honestly, I can I can do that. So let's confirm. We have we'll, we'll wow. We want to tip our hand that. here. We want to tip yeah, our we're getting hand. way we'll ahead of things, aren't we? Yeah. Debo Samuel. Yeah. Nick Bosa. Fred Warner, you added Javon Hargrave, George Kittle, Trent Williams. Did you get to Christian McCaffrey? I did not get to Christian McCaffrey. Thank you. So this is seven. Seven. And probably two potential more, three potential more. Oh, yeah. Between Hufunga and Armstead and Ayuk, depending on their performances this season. Like, you, they, they have a reasonable argument to make. Yeah. So, But let's just start with seven. Start with, start with seven. Let's start with seven. There's probably okay. going to be one or two more by the end of the year. Um, the Falcons have two. Okay. The Panthers have one. The Bears have two. So that's five. The Texans have one. That's six. The Commanders have two. So that's eight. The Steelers have three. That's 11. And the Colts have four. Okay. So you have 15 across the other seven teams that we have done, and the 49ers by themselves have seven. It's a lot of premier talent for us to talk about here talent. on the 49ers. Kyle, I guess we ought to start with the offensive side of the football. In case you're new to the series here, what we've done is taken the time to study the film on these players. We've categorized every single player on the roster um, in terms of a roster cornerstone, a quality starter, a rookie, an adequate starter, replacement level, quality depth, non-roster caliber, incomplete evaluation, or a practice squad developmental player. And so Kyle and I have done the research, we've watched the film, and we're ready to talk about the 49ers here today on the podcast, starting with the offense, Kyle. And I guess I set the table there, so you get the first dibs on your prevailing thought with this 49ers offense. Uh, man, I'd make a bigger deal of the offensive line if there wasn't a significant track record of this offensive line going through uh, attrition in the past and being just fine, <laughs> right? Uh, I think there's some some legitimate concerns about what you have on the interior with Brendel was a first-year starter last year. He was good last year. Like, let's be honest, Jake Brendel was good, but he was a first-year full-time starter last year. Mm-hmm. So the sample size of him as a starting NFL caliber player, and you had a first-year starter in Aaron Banks on his left-hand side, and you had a rookie starter in the fourth round in Spencer Buford, on his right side. Mm-hmm. You have Colton McKivitt stepping in for Mike McGlinchey. I think that's probably the big mystery question for San Francisco is McKivitt's uh, athletic toolsy, long, kind of built like McGlinchey, but McGlinchey got 17 and a half per from the Broncos. I'll say this. I don't blame the 49ers for not paying McGlinchey that dollar amount for the product that they got. So... Having stuff in the pipeline ready to replace 
I think is essential for San Francisco. And I do think, you know, Matt Pryor has not played the best football he's put on film as of late, but him as a utility offensive lineman that could probably play three spots on this line or four if Trent Williams were to miss any time, I think is a valuable piece as well. So they got young players in Jalen Moore and uh, Nick Zekolj behind that are pipeline players that were rookies from 2022, I believe. Both of those guys were 2022. Uh, prior utility guy. So I, I think they have the right chemistry here for this to work out just fine. And, and Shanahan has an ample track record of getting elevated offensive line play when letting Lake and Tomlinson walk, unless we forget Lake and Tomlinson was not Lake and Tomlinson when he first got to San Francisco. Right. And now transitioning from McGlinchey to McKivitz, and McGlinchey's been up and down. I thought he was better last year than 2021, but um, I think this is a little bit of a chemistry experiment up front that maybe will take a little bit time to settle in with the change at right tackle. Yeah, I think the big talking point for me as well is on this offensive line. Uh, Trent Williams is as good of a player as there is in the NFL. And like you said there, the little the middle three, it's all returning. It's it's guys that played last year. Big wild card at right tackle. But I think in a vacuum, you look at this offensive line and you'd be greatly concerned by it. But because of the track record here and just Shanahan's ability to just figure it out and get elevated offensive line play from from players, you kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. And so it's uh it's an interesting foil there um, between what they actually have and you know, then applying it to the lens of the Shanahan offense. God, these skill players are really good, man. Really good. Loaded. I mean, Debo Samuel, George Kittle, Christian McCaffrey, but like Brandon Ayuk's a star, man. He was a player that I really enjoyed watching on the perimeter, his release packages, his separation ability, his ball skills, the athleticism. Like he's a really dynamic player. And um, I know there was like some trade rumblings about him earlier in the off season, but if I'm San Francisco, I'm just going to enjoy having him to go with all those guys and make sure that, you know, some encouraging words about Brock Purdy yesterday from Kyle Shanahan about his availability, you know, early in the season, but whoever's going to be playing quarterback early on, whether it's Purdy, Lance, Darnold, having these weapons is really, really exciting. Like the stars are the stars, but even, some of the depth players and like a, an ancillary players like Juwan Jennings, like Elijah Mitchell, you know, I think, I think this is the best one, two running back punch in the league here in CMC and Elijah Mitchell. So just a lot to love here in terms of these skill players in this offense. Yeah, this is, um, hasn't always been this way, but it's very easy to see how a young quarterback can step into this situation and have success when you have a good play designer and play caller and, just the the variance of angles that that you can come at a team at from with McCaffrey in the passing game and George Kittle and what he does as a true unicorn for the blocking skills and the receiving skill set, even as his receiving production has waned because you have Brandon Ayuk and Christian McCaffrey now in this offense where in years past when Kittle was putting up 1,200 yards, those guys weren't there, right? And, and then Debo Samuel with the scheme touches that you can – it's it's a pain in Problems. the butt. Yeah, it's a it's pain problems. in the butt. <laughs> yeah. How um, about that catch Kittle had in the playoffs against Dallas, Mike? The, the bobbler, the bobbler on the seam up the middle. How on earth, like twice off of his fingertips and hauls it in? And was it Diggs coming in? They tried to tried to right. They tried to snatch and, the ball off his off like, his fingertips at the same just time. Completely unbothered. Completely unbothered by that. It was a crazy play. So I'm I'm gonna look something up. We have I have scored the 49ers in, in our actual, like we do this process, but then we actually like, there's a number value that each player at each spot gets. Uh, so I have the 49ers scored and I just want to check real quick. This might be the best scoring because we did this this time last year before the 49ers had McCaffrey. And we did it at the mid season point before the 49ers are like right when they first got Christian McCaffrey. So I'm interested to see just how well this, skill group scores historically versus like last year when we did this. Uh, yeah, this is the best skill group that we have scored. Wow. Now, there's some teams that might have a say in this between the Bengals with their wide receivers and 
the Dolphins with their wide receivers. I think the tight ends are probably going to hold them up a little bit, and I don't think their ceiling in the running back room is quite as high. So you might have wide receiver rooms that outscore San Francisco, but I mean, they've got a a cornerstone player, a tight end wide receiver and running back, and then they have an adequate starter as the RB2, and they have a quality starter as the other wide receiver on the other side. Oh, by the way, Kyle Juszczyk's floating around in here, too. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot to like it, but you do have questions with the offensive line. And then, of course, quarterback with Brock Purdy, with all that he demonstrated late in the season last year. I mean, did some exciting things. And really, I thought there was just a lot of poise with, with some of those moments where he was able to hang in there, keep his eyes down the field, hit some throws down the field. You know, I think learning how to kind of handle some pressure and, and – navigate a little bit is going to be some growth areas for him but you know we'll see how he looks with this opportunity and and you know they do have depth they do have depth at quarterback right so is that I think worth, expectations are high here do you, do you want to circle back to qb just a little bit when sure. we do segment three because i know coming to consensus we're pretty light we've only got a handful of players that we got to really iron out uh, i think it might be worth coming back to darnold and what he could be versus what he showcased when he was most recently playing and obviously Purdy with, with the playoff run. And I think there's some stuff there. Maybe we come back to Joe. All right. We'll, we'll come back to that. Next is the defense where there was some turnover here on the unit. So we're going to break that down here in just a moment. But first we need to tell you about FanDuel. make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs, because right now new customers get a no sweat first bet up to a thousand dollars. That's $1,000 in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, so whether it's the NBA playoffs, the NHL playoffs, MLB season is in full swing, you've got NFL futures that you can get in on, and so check out what the over-under is for certain teams out there, and you can put some money down on that. And there is simply just no better place to bet on all the sports action than America's number one sports book. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. You don't have a dual monitor set up, do you? Uh, no. I have another Have computer. you ever had a dual monitor set up? Yes. You ever have, like, that moment where you're moving your mouse around? It goes to the other one? Well, no, you, you just can't find your mouse. Oh, gosh. That just happened to me. Because, like, we, we got to make sure that the FanDuel overlay yeah. on the bottom third comes up. Yeah. So you're transitioning, and I'm moving my mouse around like this. And I'm going like way over here and way over here. And the mouse just would not appear on the screen that's right in front of my face here. And I'm like, what is happening? And I'm self-conscious with the mic because people tell me, oh, Kyle, I can hear you breathing into your mic. Or Kyle, I can hear your clicks. Or Kyle, your mic's too hot. Or Kyle, your mic's too cold. So I'm like, I don't want to sit here and be doing this. (laughs) I found it. You wouldn't know that because you can't see the production setup because I'm floating around producing this thing. But I just want to let you know that that was my latest struggle was in the midst of you telling everybody about FanDuel. Overcoming adversity here on the podcast. Trying. Trying to. Uh, Defensively, you talk about blue chip talent. How about it? Is it fair to add Javon Hargrave to this defensive front? Needed to. Maybe it's not fair, but they also kind of needed to. Well, yeah, and I think that's probably a good point. When you think about what they've added, they added the player they thought they were getting in Javon Kinlaw. (laughs) Right. This is who Javon Kinlaw was supposed to be. So you go out and you pay him $21 million. You effectively trade him for Mike McGlinchey. I'd say you won that trade from a financials perspective. Eric Armstead missed some time early. Nick Bose is a monster. I don't monster. think we need to yeah. I don't think we need to to exhaust too much time telling anybody how great Nick Bose is. That's pretty well established. I guess the other edge spot is interesting. I think Kerry Hyder is going to get a lot of run here. Obviously Drake Jackson is a a day two draft selection for them last year. And it sounds like he's put on some weight, kind of play that, that's that base end role. Um, but they need, they need somebody 
elevating into that other spot. I think they'd be fine regardless because of how disruptive they are with the other three guys on the front. But if you're going to have complete play up front, I think that is kind of the mystery bag with this 49ers defensive line because I think the rest of the depth that you have between Austin Bryant and Kevin Givens, and Givens has popped a little bit, but he's he's a low-ceiling player, it generally feels like, and Kinlaw has not taken the step forward, and Cleveland Farrell busted out of, of Las Vegas. So um, I don't think the depth is great. So having somebody else who is a higher floor player on that fourth spot on the line, I, I think would be big for San Francisco to, to have really complete play up front. I think it's critical. Uh, Bosa, Hargrave, Armstead, those are amazing players, but I think they enjoyed contributions last year from like Charles Amenihu and Samson Ebicon. Those guys aren't back, right? Yep. So they're relying on Kerry Hyder slash Drake Jackson slash Cleland. Uh, is it, how do we say his name? Cleland? Cleland Furl, Cleland. Cleland. Yeah. Cleland you know, I, those guys coming in and, and making an impact in, in a rotational capacity is going to be really important. I'm, I'm excited for Furl here. Uh, I really am. Um, I hope he does thought, something with it. Yeah, and that's a tough that was a tough ask always for him with the Raiders. Um, not his fault he was picked so high and um it was kind of an uphill climb. I I mean I, I watch didn't him work be out. Solomon Thomas all over again. Maybe, dude. But I I think he's got a chance to come here and play reasonably good football. The pressure's off, right? You're go there, you're part of a great group, right? I mean, yeah, a you, very established you just have to situation. Be the, the fifth or sixth best lineman now. Right, and play 30% of the snaps or something like that, and and I think he can do it. I think he can matter. Um, but the depth here, I mean, yeah, the stars are the stars on this D-line, but I think the depth here is going to be important. Who do you think would be more harmful to miss for an extended period of time, Hargrave or Bosa? Bosa. And we asked that question because, like, the star power is so prominent here, but there is – like the potential for a, a significant drop yeah, with the lack explosive. of depth. Yeah. Linebackers are awesome. Fred Warner, Dre Greenlaw. We don't have to a lot of, spend a lot of time there. That's That speaks for itself. Best one-two punch in the league. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair, right? Who's who? I don't, can't even think of who's uh, – the Ravens maybe with Queen and Smith. That's probably your – Oh, and then you have what uh, Chicago went out and bought too. Yeah, we, we got to see Edmonds and Edwards. Yeah, they're, I think they're going to be limited by that D line, but but just yeah, the talent of the players themselves. Yeah, yeah. super it's, super talented. It's, worth, it's probably a top five linebacker room. I'm excited, and we kind of teased this when we talked about the Falcons because we enjoyed Isaiah Oliver so much when we studied them. Him coming over to this football team is really exciting to pair with Traverius Ward, who is a solid player, and then. Uh, you know, Diamador Lenore played a lot of football last year. He got tested a lot. You know, he should be better in this season. But, you know, I, I really think Isaiah Oliver can be be an impact player for this defense uh, to go with, uh, you know, to, to Talano Hufunga at safety, who's an absolute star in the in the making here. And then Deshaun Gibson at whatever, like 31 years old, came out and played great football for, the, for them last year. And so, you know, this defense does lose some things with Jimmy Ward no longer being part of the mix. I mentioned a couple of the defensive linemen that they no longer have. Um, Emmanuel Mosley is no longer here. But I thought they, they made good moves here in in free agency with very limited resources to kind of piece it back together. And obviously, into coaching turnover here with Demico Ryan's not being around. But I like the makeup of this secondary. Um. Let's make sure I get my facts right here. By the way, Steve Wilkes coming in to run the defense. Mm -hmm. This is going to be the best defense in the league. Ooh. Joe, look look at the color. I'll pull it up for everybody watching on YouTube. The, just look well, at the colors. The, look they at get the, the colors on the defense. The Cardinals. Four games four, against them. Right. That's you get four help. games against those pop gun offenses. You got cornerstone 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 quality starter quality starter quality starter i'm going to make an argument for two more quality starters on this unit adequate starter okay your cb2 is not great unless i unless you want to count isaiah oliver as your cb2 wouldn't you wouldn't you i would think about playing him outside we'll, we'll see if the, he'll what are you going to do ambry thomas or lenore in the slot or are you going to put miles hartsfield there 
Hartfield's played there. I don't think he's very good. Correct. He's not. And maybe they, maybe you get maybe you go big nickel too, and you get Jair Brown out there as a third round rookie that you clearly felt some type of way about that you drafted him with one of your first couple picks. You got options. Sam Womack as well. From a talent perspective, if this team's healthy, I see no reason why Steve Wilkes as a defensive coordinator is going to have any any level of drop off. This should be the top defense in the NFL this year. That's just I I mean, they they certainly can be. They certainly can be, and I think their schedule will absolutely help with that. I'm looking at it right now. Well, and I that's need... what I was just going to come to next was to say, okay, how many low-hanging fruit offenses do we play this season? Especially if they can control games with the clock. Rams, Cardinals, Bucks. I think I think Pittsburgh week one is a favorable matchup defensively for San Francisco as well. Matt Canada. I think the coaching will be a big advantage there. They get Dallas at home, and they, they dude, they've clamped Dallas in the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, at Cleveland, Minnesota's a good matchup. Bengals is a tough one. They get the Bucks. Man, Niners Bengals is a four twenty five kick on CBS. What happened there? Week eight. I wonder who's that. How how is that not in prime time? <laughs> NFL Sunday Night Football schedule. Gonna float around, produce this thing. On what happened there? A couple different levels. Oh, was it week eight? Uh, Freaking I... Bears, Chargers. Switch it up. Let's get flex this... it out. Get this. Flex get it out. out. Of there. Bears, Chargers, get it out of there. Oh, and then we got Bills, Bengals the next week. So that's why because Bengals were on Sunday Night Football the next week. Oh, so the Bills get the Bengals after they play Sam Fran. Yeah, that's that feels good. That Just feels good. good. Yeah, good. That, that, beat up on them a little bit. Yeah, we'll put them in a little Pound two game rock. skit if we can, you know. Pound the rock. Um, so yeah, we're we're not supposed to be doing schedule stuff. I'd like to talk to you about doing some schedule stuff, but not we're, yet, we're, not right now. Not right we're now. going to. Yeah. Um, I even feel pretty good about like there's there's a lot of the depth in the secondary that's that's battle tested players too. They might not be high ceiling players, and they also might not be high floor players. But like you mentioned, Lenore. Played a good bit. Yeah, he had his moments. He was tested a lot, but I thought he had his moments for sure. So, um, yeah, I, I have a hard time seeing a defense outscoring this this group for our roster assessment just with the amount of cornerstones that we gave it. This is a stud group. We come to consensus here to close. We got, got a couple some, players defensively. And we want to talk a little quarterback stuff. So Okay, great. That's what we're going to do here to close on this episode of Locked On NFL Scouting. I feel like we should start with Isaiah Oliver because we've brought him up a bunch. We brought him up ahead of this show on a different show. Okay. So I, I think you jumped the gun. I think you jumped the gun. You think I gave him too high of a grade? Is that what you're sitting there? I see you looking down. So obviously no, I know just, you're typing. So I did. Yeah. You know, I, what are you pulling? Are you pulling up numbers for Isaiah Oliver? Of course. To state I am. your case. I. So I have I trust him as the tape. A, trust. The tape. I have. Okay. If you want to. Okay. I have him as an adequate starter. Kyle has him as a quality oh, let, starter. Uh, let, me pull, let me pull up the depth chart so everybody can right, see what put, we're Put it up about. there. Okay. I loved what I watched from Isaiah Oliver last year. Loved it. And if you said that's who he has always been, I'm not going to fight you for a second that he's a quality starter. But, but. kind of a part-time role for the Falcons defense last year. Out of his five NFL seasons, he's only been a primary starter twice for the team that drafted him. He got hurt in 2021. He was all awesome I know is year. all I know is this man is had, can allowed a passer rating against a 76 last year. He was awesome. 42 targets. It's a reasonable sample size. Cut down on the missed tackles. I, if you want to talk about 2022, I'm not going to have anything to say. He was I a would like to talk about 2022. Okay. What, um, hold on. I don't want to be too. How, how would you explain um, Talanoa Hufunga then? 
He's a younger player. Okay. Isaiah Oliver signed a two-year, $6.75 million deal. So the NFL had the opportunity to evaluate Isaiah Oliver, and they said, you know what? You're about a $3.5 million a year. Quarter. It's because nobody cares about nickels. They don't? I just think he's a nickel. All right. You're not, you're not budging here. I'll come up. I, okay. Because when, when your argument starts with, I loved him on tape last year, you, you kind of put yourself in a hole. You think so, but I also have four years before that of <laughs> not quite that level of play. I like him, though. Okay. Uh, He's still young, f- too, isn't he? Let me see how old he is. 26. 26? Yeah, yeah. yeah Furl or Tashawn Gibson? Let's keep it in the defensive backfield. This is another one where I have uh, – well, G- Gibson is who we're going to go with. I have him as a – Adequate. Adequate starter. You have him as a – quality starter. quality starter based off of last year and he's been a relatively high floor player he just d- never yeah. had like the crazy amount of ball production but i attribute that to playing in san francisco yeah i mean it, this is gonna be his age 33 season i think he is an extremely high floor player i really do believe that I guess I should probably be fair to Gibson. In 2013 and 2014 combined, he had 11 interceptions. So the fact that he had five picks last year is not... He he had a career resurgence. Kind of went, went where players go to go off the map for a little while with that stretch in Jacksonville, Houston, and Chicago is a hell of a three-piece of stops. He's probably excited to be in San Fran, man. Right. And with Cleveland to start his career in the early, in the early like teens. And, and look, the, the only other argument I'll make it, if you don't want to buy it, you don't want to buy it. You were flexible with me on Isaiah Oliver. So I'm willing to be flexible here, but he's playing in a system that is largely not going to put him responsible for covering sideline to sideline. He's a deep third player. And with that in mind, I think that sets him up favorably to not have what I think is the biggest threat of slowing him down. He'll be 33 on August 7th is athletic range, but Hafunga is going to play in the box. Hafunga is going to live in the box. Mm -hmm. You have these, these corners that are going to play outside zone. You have a nickel. So it's not like he, he's going to be pretty elementary with his role. And while I, I think it's, it's a little more vanilla of a role to fill with what else they have in the defense. I think it allows him to still be a quality player in the role because they don't need him to be something that he can't be anymore. So the scheme has to mask limitations. This is a quality starter. I didn't say that. (laughs) I said within, within the, his role within the scheme, he's a quality starter at that job because you're not asking to be something that he's not. So you're you're clearly not you're not buying. That's fine. I think he's a sufficient level starter. Okay. He's gonna go out and have five picks again, and then Kyle's gonna get. This is oh. gonna be a thing every week on you the. Know, I, I, I remember when when the 49ers fans came after Trevor for <laughs> who was it? Adrian Colbert after year one, and then <laughs> Trevor was and then crashed and burned. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but and Trevor completely backtracked on Right. <laughs> out here writing apology articles. Uh, he's like, you guys were right. He was great last year. And then he came out and was like, oh. <laughs> Turns out he was a seventh round pick for a reason. Shout out, Trevor. Uh, what's the other one? Furl? Furl is our last one. I have Furl as quality depth. And I have him as a replacement level player. Just if you based can re- off of... Yeah. Well, uh, if you can, you remove ahead. the fact that he was a top five pick and didn't meet those expectations. Because I, for me, once I do that, I think he's a reasonable depth player. He's with some upside. Seven hundred and fifty snaps the last two seasons. Yeah, and a crap defense. I know Max Crosby produced and all that, but who else, who else besides Max Crosby has produced on that defense? I mean, he didn't. He didn't really rush the passer last year. He had thirteen pressures. On almost 500 snaps. Mm. Okay. Is he too far gone to put as an incomplete eval? 
Oh, uh, surely. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's eighteen hundred snaps across four seasons. All right. I don't want to beat the horse to death. I'll, I'll meet you with Cleveland Farrell. We'll put him as quality death. All right. Um, who starts week one? Darnold. Trey. Surely not Purdy with the elbow injury. Shanahan didn't rule it out. Um, I think they want it to be Purdy. I think he won over a lot of people with what he did last year, man. And I, I would agree with you, but the, I would make that the case to be take your time with it. Uh, Don't for rush sure. him back. Yeah, yeah, you can't rush him back. You can't do that. You, you, you literally went out and got two other former top three picks in the NFL <laughs> draft. Don't you have to play Trey Lance if he's healthy and Brock Purdy's not? Don't you just have to? Because at some point you have to salvage this, right? You have you have to position yourself to trade him or something. Something has to happen here. The dude hasn't played football in a long, long time. That's a problem. I agree with you. I think you could make the case. Didn't they already kind of cut their nose off to spite their face when they brought Donald in in the first place to do damage to quote unquote salvaging the Trey Lance investment. I think it's a great spot for Sam Darnold. And I, I agree with you. Like I was watching Brock Purdy play and I'm like, I think Sam Darnold can do stuff in this system. He's got a lot more physical upside. And if any track record is going to give us any indication based on the amount of quarterbacks that play in these Shanahan systems on an annual basis, we'll probably see some Sam Darnold. And some yeah, Trey Lance. And some Brock Purdy. Would not be surprised. Yeah, I mean, when was the last time a 49ers team had the same quarterback every game? It was the one year they went to the Super Bowl, yeah, right? It was With Jimmy G and Jimmy 19. G. Every other year, it's like two, three starters every single season. And obviously, last year, they, they were down to the bones. They were on QB5 last year. <laughs> Literally QB five, and then Brock Purdy got Brock Purdy got all these dudes drafted. We had fourteen quarterbacks drafted this year. It's the hey, most in twenty sixteen, and there wasn't we, fourteen draftable quarterbacks, dude. You we, know that. We watched Olu yesterday. How many times watching Olu play for Penn State were you just like, dude? Sean Clifford went in the fifth round. Several times, Kyle. Several. This guy got drafted. I think it is. I think I think Sam will start week one, barring Purdy being ready to go. Man, if Trey Lance is also healthy, that's crazy. I mean, I I don't I don't think you're wrong. I predictively think that would happen, but like, I would just play Trey just to play him. You knew what you had in Trey, and you still made the cognitive decision to go out and get Sam anyway. That's a hell of a way to put it. Which is why I thought they cut their nose off to spite their face in the sake of salvaging the Trey Lance investment. I don't think there is any salvaging the Trey Lance investment. Like well, I think that just is what it is. Don't you – I mean, nobody gets three chances at a quarterback. Right? And, and Shanahan, between paying – trading for and paying Jimmy G, trading up, giving up everything for Trey Lance, those are two huge whiffs. For your answer to be – they're still winning games. It's incredible. So that's what, that's how you end up falling into Brock Purdy and potentially having – Another bridge extended for probably, what, throughout the course of his rookie contract before you have to make a decision on whether or not you're going to pay him before you have to make that decision at all? I mean, how special would he have to be? Knowing your track record with quarterbacks, how special would Purdy have to be to wind – I mean, by the time this comes around, he's like, it's like a $50 million a year quarterback plus. Probably more, right? Yeah. I mean, you're talking four years from now, three years from now? Yeah. Already getting some rumblings about Mahomes reworking his deal now that he's the eighth highest paid quarterback in the league. Yeah. Burrow's coming. Herbert's coming. Tua st stays healthy. He's coming. Trevor yeah. Lawrence. He ain't, yeah, Trevor's coming. I don't think Tua gets 50. If, Tre if Tua stays healthy and does what he did last year, he's getting 50. I don't think so. I think he get 45. 
because the team would the team would always in that negotiation if they paid him after this year they'd always be able to say but the missed games Well, they could also just not do it. They, he's under contract next year too. Right. Do the Dak year, Prescott I mean. thing with him. Yeah. Put him in a contract here. I know it's not exactly Dak because Dak was a first round pick. Do do the Lamar Jackson thing with him and extend him out and go year over your time. year. You're you're going to pay about the same amount of money. You just don't have as much cap flexibility. I think the bottom line here is that the 49ers just require a, a different lens than any other team when you talk about them because the, the the rules are different for them. As has been proven across the course of the right the Shanahan era here. The rules it's are an different. awesome football team, though. Awesome football team. That's going to do it for us here on Locked on NFL scouting with the San Francisco 49ers. I'm, I'm sure I don't need to say this out loud, but this is the highest scoring roster that we have given, and we are not grading quarterbacks until we are done all 32 teams because how you grade quarterbacks is a little different than how you grade everybody else. So um, they take this top spot by 25%. Hmm. 18% over the next highest ranked team out of all the teams that we've done. We're a quarter of the way through the league, Joe. Wow, really? Eight teams. Wow. Jaguars some, up next. Jaguars up next. And then uh, we need to talk about Friday. We have the 2021 QB situation down, but then we have the Patriots on Monday. Monday. We might have to do some flipping around, but. I think we'll probably flip, do Patriots on Friday, do the, the quarterback show on Monday. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, good news is we're pretty familiar with the Patriots, so that should be a pretty easy administrative change. <laughs> is anyone going to listen to that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll hate listen. No, they'll come no, no. listen to us. <laughs> yeah, it's our. We have a big Dolphins Bills base here. They'll they'll love to hear us. Right? About they'd come in and listen. And, and look, Patriots have plenty of redeeming qualities. It's just the, the question of the ceiling and the continued commitment to the bit that Bill Belichick is on. We'll talk about that on Friday. So hit subscribe. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. I'm Kyle Krabs. He is Joe Marino. We are the Draft Dudes. Appreciate you guys checking out the show. Make it a great rest of your Wednesday. We'll be back and talk to you all again tomorrow. Peace.